So the Crusades is a topic that I didn't announce last month. So anybody that was here, we spoke about the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, which was really impressive. And it was overwhelming to prepare for and probably overwhelming to hear because there's so much of it. And, um, and I, had, I had said that after that class, I made the mistake of predicting what I was going to speak about this time, and I was going to be the historical Jesus, what secular scholars say of the life of Jesus, rather the first part being the Bible and then the next part what the secular historians say. Well, the nature of this class is that I try to keep it relevant because pastors in this church and other churches do a great job of digging into the Word and getting into the Bible, and that's what, it's, that, that's what church is there for. We, we come together and then we study the Word. But there's a lot of times in this culture, and the reason for apologetics, and the reason for this reason why class, is to be able to reach unbelievers who are so distracted by different objections in this culture that keep them from the gospel, keep them from the cross, keep them from Jesus. And it, it's irresistible grace. They're going to be coming. But we are part of that process, believe it or not. God actually made us part of that process. So what had happened over the last month or so is that I get a lot of these objections from people because I love getting into the dialogue of, in, in the public s square with people in person, online. And I kept hearing this objection that I've heard in the past, but now it seems to be ramping up even that much more. How can you, Christian, speak ill of these Muslims or really condemn any of that violence when you look at the crusades of the Christian's past? who slaughtered, raped, pillaged, and did so many evils in the name of Christ, your God. And so it caused me pause. The, the, the knee-jerk reaction would be, well, there's lots of bad things that Christians do, right? So we could grant all that, but that's not following Christ. So let's point to Muhammad and Christ and see the difference there. And I think there's a valid point to that. But what about those claims about the raping and pillaging and conquests by Christians doing all those evil things? Rather than just granting that, maybe we should re-examine it and see if that's really true. So what I'm going to try to do today, and like the, the, these topics, same-sex marriage, abortion, now we're on the Crusades, it's really tough to cram into an hour. Uh, but we're going to try that. My talk hopefully will be like 40 minutes or so, maybe 45 minutes, and then have a discussion on things you've heard. But before we do that, what do we know about the Crusades? This is a test class pretest. Just what, or just what have you heard, to, to take the pressure off, what have you heard your friends say about the Crusades? Christians initiated against the Muslims. So it's a Christian initiated war. Is that fair? What was, what, what was another one? Anyone? Retaking Jerusalem. Retaking Jerusalem, okay, so. Are you looking for just things that have been said or heard or things that are actually correct? Both. Okay. Let's just see let's see what's out there. I mean this is really just trying to get a sampling of what people, Christians too, are saying. Initiated war, but it was an offensive war. Right, right. Okay. I'm sure you'll get into So these two are a little opposite, but I'll just clarify or paren this. Offense, oops, offensive. Anything else about the Crusades? What have you heard? What? Let's go to what the skeptics are saying, the people that are objecting to Christianity or being critical. Especially things that you don't know an answer to, or maybe believe yourself. Anything else? Holy war. Okay. So it's it's war for God, right? War for God, war for Allah. They're both the same. <laughs> so they say. Anything else? We'll get into some more in a minute, um, and I'll I'll list out a few. Uh, objections that I've heard as well. Let's see. Okay, so that's that part. Here's some of the things that I've had to wrestle with, some of the questions that I hear, some of the things that I've taken as, can you guys see, a as common knowledge among just the public. You know, if you ever bring up anything about Christianity, Crusades comes into the objection. These are some of the things. The Crusades are the main reason for tensions between the Middle East and the West. 
So ever since that happened, it's been a train wreck for relations between Muslims and Christians. Christianity condones violence because the church commanded the crusades. So you have leadership in the church that is saying, go and kill. And that's what we hear often. Christians are hypocrites when pointing to the acts of Muslim aggression. That's probably the number one. Who are you to say when the crusaders did the same thing you're criticizing? Religion in general causes most of the world's wars. You hear that from typically secular atheists who are critical right, of Muslims and Christians. In fact, there was somebody posting <coughs> on this class saying, I hate both Islam and Christianity, so I'm an equal opportunity uh, critic. And so you hear that a lot, that both Islam and Christianity, any religion, caused the war. The Crusades are the main example of European uh, colonialism that tramples on enlightened yet less militarized cultures. The true approach to Christian evangelism is merciless conversion by the sword, oh, my misspelling, as the Crusades revealed. There's no difference between the assurance of heaven by taking part in a crusade than what a Muslim terrorist believe. The Crusades caused the decline of the Middle East. So if any of those jumped out at you, just bank them in the back of your mind and we'll make sure we address them by the time we get to the end. And if we don't explicitly mention them by the information in the survey that we're going to do of the Crusades, hopefully we'll answer them for you. So what we're going to try to do is give a history <laughs> from the very beginning all the way through. So it's about a, what is it, about a 1,300-year history lesson in about 30 minutes. But before we do that, we've had public apologies by notables like Bill Clinton, Pope John Paul II. Oops. And in 1999, they had what's called the Reconciliation Walk across Europe. Mostly Americans and, and Europeans took to the streets to march and retrace the footsteps of the First Crusade with a pre-printed stack of apology letters that they would hand out to anybody they came in contact with, speaking of the we apologize on behalf of all Christians everywhere for the Crusades. Not so much an apologist, but a, a notable, outspoken person on the Crusades. Somebody who took that to heart, just like Bill Clinton, Pope John Paul, and the Reconciliation Walkers did, is Osama bin Laden and al-Zawahiri, too, who are both fully aware of the mistakes that they had made now. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now just give you just an outline. This is what we're going to try to do. So I'm going to try to give you a real quick thumbnail sketch of the early church and a little thumbnail sketch of Islam. And where the two converge is where the Crusades happen, but real, real, real basically. And what happened in the immediate precursors to the Crusades. Um, a little bit about what happened in Europe after that, what caused the Crusades, um, and then how the Crusades are remembered, especially traditionally and by people like Bill Clinton and our... Uh, people that we speak to at the water coolers about Christ who bring up the Crusades in opposition. <coughs> and then if there's questions along the way, please just chime in because it's a lot of information. I'm going to try to not do too much, but I also uh, can't do too much because this is not an area that I'm an expert in. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you on the Crusades. It's something that I did a lot of research on, but I just I get more overwhelmed the more research. You know, every book you read, you think, oh my gosh, there's so much. And every crusade has books for each crusade. So I can't go too deep in this. My point for reason why is not to make you experts or say that I'm an expert in the Crusades, but to overcome these objections, because it's very easy to overcome the objections with just a little bit of knowledge. So I'm just going to put that out there so I don't want to fake it like I'm an expert. There's people in this room I know who are, who are more experts in this than I am, so we can pick their minds a little bit. I won't call you out on it right now, but <laughs> there's people that know. Okay, so here's where, if you look, is it, okay. This, this is modern day Turkey here, okay? Uh, Palestine, um, Egypt. So this, as you can see, the red dots are all the early churches by 70 AD. So when Christianity first started and started to spread, this is where Paul was doing a lot of his walks. Here, uh, uh, Rome is way over here. So this is where the Roman church uh, set up in the fourth century, but, and, and prior to that too, but that's where the empire uh, started after Constantine's uh, conversion. But look at where already was 
heated up way before then. So by 70, this is where most of Christianity was. And for the first four centuries, uh, actually six centuries, this was, this was the hotbed of Christianity. This is the old Christian world. This is where everything was happening. Um, so that's important to understand. That was Christian, all of that. Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, um, Egypt, Christian. And we all know that Christianity didn't start out in power, right? Christians weren't the ones running the show. In fact, it came up despite not being in, in power. So they were oppressed from the very beginning. And so they were growing despite this persecution. And throughout the early church, they had to wrestle with some difficult things because here and today, we just show up to church, maybe there's a football game, we don't come. But back in the early church, you had emperors of varying degrees of persecution. There was, this is a real thing where people, people were crucified like Christ was if they weren't Roman citizens. Um, but they were also eaten alive by beasts. They were burned at the stake. This kind of shows a, a couple of those scenes at once. Lots of bad stuff, and it was for entertainment at times in, in the Colosseum, other times not so public, but they were persecuted. And so it was a temptation to say, well, you could get out of this, not every case, but sometimes they were given the option, you could hail to Caesar, you could say Caesar is king and you serve no other, or you could be killed. And a lot of people decided to die for their faith, but there were some who said, okay, no, hail Caesar. But then they had to be incorporated back into the church body. How did they do that? Over the first few centuries of the church, they had to come up with some way to kind of balance that out. Because you had one widow sitting here watching her, her, her husband die, maybe even her kids die too. And here she is fighting for the faith. And then somebody else comes in the next Sunday and uh, they s said they'd hail Caesar. So that could be really awkward, right? Um, so I don't know the whole background from the penance system or the indulgences where you pay in to get some um, forgiveness of your sins. But that was, we have to kind of understand the historical context. There was, there was some understanding to that early on. Um, and the reason why I bring that up, you'll see as we go, um, one of the things that the church did when they launched the crusades was to issue penance to those who would take the pilgrimage on the crusade and that would forgive your sins by taking that action. And that's one of the ugly truths of the Crusades is we have to say that was just bad theology. That's not biblical. That's, uh, that's, that's not grace. That's, that's purely works-based, and there's no biblical precedent for that. This is Constantine um, in, um, I think it was 312, or the early part of the 4th century. Constantine had a conversion, and that's when the empire became Christian, and that's when Christians started wielding the power. So they were a significant church by this point, but they didn't have the power and, and, and were underneath the, the pagan emperor up to this point. In 476, Rome is sacked and Rome declines. The new capital becomes Byzantium, what's known as Istanbul now. Uh, so it's Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, and then, um, uh, and now Istanbul. So that you can see the split here. The West, uh, although you see Spain, Gaul, which is modern day France, Italy, they weren't like today in the Olympics, everybody comes from this part and they're, they're Italians. You've got a, uh, a, a parliament or a representatives, you've got a leader of the country. That's not how it worked back then. You had nobles that, that ran certain areas of different regions, like princes that would have control over certain regions. But you didn't have nations where, the, even though the region was called Italy or Gaul or Spain, you didn't have somebody in charge. Even if there was a king, it wasn't in charge of, of the whole thing. You didn't have complete rule. So this was pretty scattered at the time. Uh, Byzantine was a little bit different in that. Uh, and then you had still the Pope in Rome. Um, and then in uh, Byzantium, right about there, you had, or no, I'm sorry, right about there, you had um, the emperor. So he ran the whole, the whole thing, even though it wasn't as tightly controlled as it is now. He was the one ruler for that empire. So in 1054, you had this split where you have the west and the east, and they didn't necessarily get along. In fact, even within the West, you had different disagreements among theology, and you had a lot of battles and a lot of people fighting each other, Christians killing Christians. 
Um, and you had some of that here too. It was very unorganized and disorderly and a little bit chaotic. Um, and so the early church, when they, I'll, I'll show you that map again, part of the penance was not only just, when we say crusade, um, what, what they did was, they said you get a penance if you, um, you know, the, the Pope here would, would speak to the people in the West and say, if you travel as a pilgrim to these holy sites, down here in Palestine to see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where Christ was um, entombed, where um, some of these uh, events happened in Bethlehem. If you go to these sites and you get penance, and that's just a pilgrimage, it's crusade. The term crusade is to seek the cross. It's cruce, crucifixion, uh, crucifix. It's, it's the cross. It's not warrior, which now is kind of the connotation. So again, that's why I mentioned the indulgences and the penance because they were going with the full mindset for their souls, independently accountable to God, not the Pope or any authority. They, said, they just learned, oh my gosh, this is important and it's for my soul. And people in this time were much more religiously minded. Um, the, the, the Christians, the Muslims, people, no matter who you were, death was at, right at your doorstep. I mean, whether it was disease, being slaughtered by your neighbor, or um, just, just for whatever reason having a shorter life. It happened a lot more and you saw it and death was right there and it was real. So it's, it makes common sense to take that logical step and, and look at, at, the, at the afterlife. Anybody who's lost somebody close, like when my mom died six weeks ago, it, it really brings you really close to the, wow, okay, and now I'm, I'm focused on the afterlife more than I was when I was you know, at the coffee machine at work yesterday. So back then, it was everyday reminder. So they're very serious about what it was for their soul. So right or wrong, on the penance thing with the pilgrimage, they were, from what we can best understand, what, what the scholars I'm reading best can understand is they were sincere in what they were doing. Timeline okay. real quick. This is prior to this is and swords and spears. No. The, 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 the crusade that when he's saying to visit the holy sites. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So this is leading up right before the crusades. So, so the period I'm going to be talking about when the actual crusades were happening was 1095 to 1291. Uh, but right after Christ and as the church was establishing itself, and it, I don't know at what point they issued the official word that you now get penance for your pilgrimage, but sometime, do you know, Dave? It was 1095. Oh, 1095 is when they issued that? Okay. But even before that, Christians were going on these pilgrimages. But in 1095, you made it official to say you get your, your penance. So that's what they did. They would, they would take their pilgrimages. Um, so now, just to quickly uh, on the rise of Islam. This is the Dome of the Rock that was built in 691 on the Temple Mount, right on top of the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, so it was right there. Um, the pilgrims that I showed you in the previous slide, and that's part of been the fun of this thing, there's <coughs> so many cool pictures that I could comb through, and very relevant too. So the, the, um, the pilgrims would come and visit the Holy Sepulchre. They'd come to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, to other holy sites. And it was revenue making for, for the Arab Muslims that were running the show. Um, and so it was, they weren't in charge. The, uh, well, you'll, you'll see how things change because the Dome of the Rock wasn't until 691. Prior to this, remember, it was all the Christian world. In fact, it was the biggest part of the Christian world. Muhammad died in 632. Prior to that, had established a huge kingdom already before his death. After that, it grew rapidly. Um, spreading the war, spreading uh, Islam by the sword was just a natural outcropping of, uh, it was a natural part of Islam. That's just how it worked. And Muhammad took the charge in that, as his followers did as well. Now here's a chart showing, let's see if I have to hit it again. Oops, is this running? Okay, it's just going to show, and you, there, like I said, how it's a little disorganized. Even within Islam, there's different branches of Islam. You have the Shia and the Sunni, and then even within them, there's differences. So this just shows how things grew so rapidly. That's uh, Arabia there in the middle. And it's not important to remember the names of these different caliphates or empires, but Notice Byzantium, keep an eye on that as we get up to about 1050. You'll see some, some change. But it's massive, it's unprecedented in their expansion, how fast that happened. They went way into India, east 
up into Greece and at the gates of Vienna. The Seljuk is, the, is also Muslim. It's the Seljuk Turks, which is a Sunni branch. And there's 1095, and you notice Turkey almost gone. And this is the period of the Crusades. Some Crusades happened after 1291, and there was calls for other ones, but it was already lost, and they were just trying to fend off attacks in their homeland at that point. The Mongols from China came down and really almost took it all in the 13th century. So that gets us to the end of the period of the Crusades. Now, this shows the battles that the Muslims did prior to the Crusades. So if you, it's very hard to see, but this is starting at the death of Muhammad in 632, and you already have Spain lighting up like a fireworks show. And you've got the islands off of Italy, Greece, Turkey, and all through the Middle East. These are people that they're conquesting by the sword, many Christians in this region. Yeah, they go way up here. Now this is getting leading up to the Crusades, but keep in mind, Crusades haven't started yet. These are battles. Spain was a mess. 200 some battles prior to the Crusades there alone, 548 battles prior to the Crusades. The next show, uh, once this clears in a minute, will be just the Battle of the Crusades to show the comparison of what had happened prior to and then afterwards. This is getting right to the end of the Crusades. And then we should see just battles in Europe after this point. There. My ignorance, but these are battles. These are Muslims. Right. To see how there's Christians because there's they won't become Muslim? Yeah. Okay. That's part of it. We're, we'll go into a little bit more of it in a minute. See how where the battles are? It's, uh, it gets all the way up into Austria here. It's, it's Austria and France. It's the central Europe, basically, before it's all gone. And then into the 16th, 17th century, there's still battles. It goes all the way till the 1920s, but the last call for crusade was around the Reformation in the 1600s, or I mean the 16th century. So it's a lot of battles. Now here's just the Crusades. Pay attention. Oh, what? no, we're not quite there yet, sorry. It's repeating. This is available on YouTube if you want to look at for it and share it, because this is information people don't necessarily have. Here's just the Crusades. Starting at 1095, this goes quick. See this, watch it. It's, it's almost over. And it's all down here, right? And it's over. So that's the Crusades. <laughs> All right. So what caused them? What was the reason for it? Was it the conquest by the, by the sword? Um, well, what, what happened was there was two main lead-ups to this. And that was, number one, as I said, it was a tourist business where the Christians could go down to the holy shrines and check things out and you know sure they got the penance and that wasn't that wasn't biblical but they made the trip peacefully i mean we have trips to israel did anybody go to the last trip to israel recently yeah, or have ever been there's there's christian I, that's on my list you know when my kids aren't toddlers anymore i want i want to go to uh, the the holy land too and it's still dangerous now but then you know they would be going down there and it, everything was fine until the turks captured things. It was Arab Muslims in control of Jerusalem, but then the Turks came in, and the Turks had a different approach to where they had zero tolerance for Christians, and so they would expel or kill or enslave Christians, and then desecrate all the relics. So they would completely, somehow, the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, which is all hooned rock, they just leveled it, or they, they, they tried, they didn't completely level it, but they did a lot of damage to where it was difficult to rebuild. And so they just wanted to, like, kick everybody out. And in the process, it got really bloody, and they were really being bad to Christians. 
And it's something that's a little reminiscent of what you hear about today, right, with, with <laughs> ISIS and the atrocities that are happening in the Middle East. I, I imagine the news being similar to that. And it got to Rome, and when it got to Rome, Pope Urban II was in, was in power as the Pope. Not power um, necessarily politically over other f spheres of life, but he was the Pope and had a lot of influence. And for months leading up to 1095, had gone around to explain this to people. And there was a famous speech at the Council of Clermont in France, central France, where he spoke, and it was a call to arms. And the, the account was that they uh, sewed crosses on their chests and said, we're going to go and, and right this wrong. He spoke of the blood that was spilled and that uh, people's intestines ripped out and just really graphic description of what was happening. And he really riled a lot of people up. And they really said, yeah, this is wrong. We're going to go. And we're going to go and, and fight these guys um, and, and, and help our fellow Christians over there. The second factor, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here. That's just a modern day depiction of some chaos in the Middle East. But the second phase was that there was a, as you saw on that other slide, you saw the Muslims encroaching into Turkey. And so they were getting right up into Byzantine at this time. And they're right at the gates of the emperor, right at the gates of the city. And so the emperor was getting really nervous, and he was going to lose his whole empire because his empire expanded far beyond that. But now they're right at his front door. So he, even though they weren't friends with Rome, sent a letter asking for help, saying, this is bad. So with the Christians being abused, the Roman and Western Christians being abused on their pilgrimages, and now the, the Muslims were at the gates of Byzantium threatening to storm in, um, they, it was too much. And that's why Pope Urban called the Crusades for those two reasons. There may be more, but those are the two big ones. And when was this? This was 1095. So, and that's just a depiction of the Council of Clermont. And who are these Crusaders? The Crusaders commonly are believed to be second, third sons, not in line to inherit their estate with not much to lose. And they would go off on those crusades and fight Muslims and get what they could out of it. Maybe some booty by robbing people along the way or some land that they could conquer once the Christians get power. Those are the thoughts in the public sphere. But who were the, these crusaders? Well, we talked a little bit about who they were. Um, and some were knights. Now, they didn't always don that heavy armor. It should still be going, I think. I oh, did it? I just like that. It stops. I, I, uh, yeah, OK. You know what? That's OK. I've got a backup camera. Thank you, though, Lynn. I appreciate that. Sometimes they had the full plated ar armor, but a lot of times they had this lighter um, mesh armor. And if you ever read about the Crusades, it's kind of interesting to find about the, the weaponry that they had, the, the crossbows that, that were much stronger and more um, accurate than the, uh, the bows that the Muslims had. And so you see kind of the, the, the techno technology differences. So there were knights, and they were the ones that were going to be defending the pilgrims on their way down. But there were, they were not all knights. There was a lot of elderly. There was a lot of just uh, you know, peasants and people that were there to support the, the knights and also the people that just wanted to go on the crusade. Because sometimes they were really old and not really able to make it very far, but they still wanted to go. Because, again, it's their soul that's on the line here. They're doing it for God. They're not doing it for the pope. They're not doing it for the Muslims. They're, they're doing what they think is right. And this is probably a more accurate picture of what it looked like. You see, you see some nights here. I don't know how many kids went along. It was a pretty rough trip. But um, then you have just ordinary people and maybe a few thousand in a group. And there were multiple groups. It wasn't one big army that just went marching all the way down there. There was different princes from different areas that took on this cause. Uh, there was one, the, Peter the Hermit, who got a lot of just people, and that was the People's Crusade. But at the same time, in 1095 to 1099, there was the People's Crusade, and then these princes grabbed their people. And they all went, and some had mercenary armies, and some, I mean, it was all very, again, disjointed. It wasn't one mission, but their, their main mission was to go and get and, and free uh, Byzantium of the Muslim threat. And then if they conquered or retook any of the Middle East, that would presumably be under control of Byzantium, the emperor who previously had control. They're just going to return it to him. Um, things got a little complicated beyond that because the emperor of Byzantium was kind of a backstabber, didn't always follow through with his word. He would take things away. He would not give support that he promised. Along the way, this is a long journey. And it's not like you have 7-Eleven or Safeway on the, uh, along the way to be able to get your, your snacks. They had to bring whatever money they could bring. It was a 
incredibly expensive. A knight's salary times five is what it would cost for a person to go on a crusade. So it was incredibly expensive with no hope of getting anything out of it. Um, and one, those who died was one out of every two people on the crusade. They estimate about 150,000 people, although numbers are really tough because there's exaggerations and, you know, for the sake of battle, there's thousands or there's just three men. And, you know, so you have, you have to read through that, but the scholars that I read kind of came up with maybe 150,000. Oh, by the way, the scholars that I'm citing, I should tell you that, really good. Uh, Thomas Madden is one of the renowned scholars for the United States. And then Jonathan Riley Smith is kind of the guy out of Cambridge. He's a professor there. So those two guys have done a lot of research on this. In fact, Jonathan Riley Smith has taken advantage of the computer records, a lot of the charters, the agreements, the mortgages that these knights would have to put on their, their castles, you know, the, these noblemen, to be able to fund this venture. Uh, it was all put to computer. And so we could see that, yeah, it is first sons that were going out on this. They had everything to lose. They're leaving their, their wives behind, and uh, only half of them came back. So we kind of see a better picture now that it's easier to access this information. And there's been this really rise of scholarship in the Crusades over the last uh, 50 years or so. This is a picture of, and I'm, I'm just rattling machine gun style at you. So if there's something you wanted to stop me on, just, just stop. We're doing all right on time. This is a depiction of 1099 by the time they got there and conquered Jerusalem. I'm shortcutting a lot because they hit Antioch. There's other cities that they, they conquered first before hitting uh, Jerusalem. But when I say conquered, keep in mind, they conquered it from the bad guys that took it from the Christian world. So they recaptured these cities. Jerusalem was the last and final success way beyond what they thought. Keep in mind, probably a quarter of them at least had died by the time they got there. Um, they're just ravished, and they, they somehow get it. It's amazing to read the stories of these battles, of how it happened and how unlikely it was, how they came together. There's no one ruler that was guiding the way. There's multiple leaders in this. Uh, they had to decide by committee, and they're really going at the fly. When the Byzantine emperor became unreliable, it was really chaotic, and they didn't know how to, how to go about this. You had the Normans coming in. You had... Uh, Byzantine mercenaries, and nobody knew necessarily who to trust. They got it. They got Jerusalem back. So the, the Crusades ended well, right? That was the first crusade. <laughs> Beyond all expectation, it ended well. Um, now, part of the uh, exculpatory uh, evidence, or the um, in the interest of full disclosure, there, there, it wasn't all roses. It wasn't all perfect, and there was a lot of blood, and there was a lot of Muslims killed, and there was probably a lot of innocent people killed. Uh, the numbers are far exaggerated, but I think it's fair to keep the historical context. We could condemn it. We can say there were some that went out just looking for Jews and would kill Jews. Um, but we also have to remember that the church expressly forbade that. And in many cases, the Jews would run to the local bishop and go in their house, and the bishop would be killed with them if they were so eager to get at those Jews that they had stormed the bishop's house. So the Jews were off limits. They were not to be touched. And there's papal bulls, meaning an official command from the pope saying, don't touch the Jews. They were also forbidden to go into Muslim land. It was only to go into Christian land to take back Christian land. They were also forbidden to spread Christianity. They could not convert anybody by the sword. Okay, so all those, that knocks out a lot of myths right there. And these are official pronouncements from the Pope. This is not something that is uh, uh, just some, somebody said. This was an official word from the Pope. This is what the Crusades were for. Just by the numbers, about 40,000 went on the First Crusade, combined from those groups I described, about 150,000 total. Again, the cost was great. The death rate was, was high. Uh, most of them returned home because the power was left there. The idea was it was going to be the Byzantium emperor taking charge, but few noblemen stayed to run the show behind. And a lot of the sieges were still occupied by Muslims. They didn't kick the Muslims out. They still were there. So it was just now the leaders were Christians, and they were tolerant of the Muslims. They could still be there. Um, so that's why a lot of the crusaders went home. They didn't just all come in and now take over. A lot of them went back, those that survived anyway and could survive the return trip. Again, it was felt wealthy first sons, not uh, people with nothing to lose, and mostly non-combatant pilgrims. By the numbers, most of them were not warriors. Now, the aftermath after that, um, it, it got bad because the Muslims just kept 
fighting and they were so fierce and so strong before uh, that it was, like I said, a surprise that they could take them at all. And that was just such a small pinprick. If you saw, that, if you remember that first video where you saw all those battles, well, the reality of it is that the Crusades were not even known in the Muslim world until the mid-1800s. I mean, the, it went unnoticed. There were so many battles and that the Crusades were so few, it was a pinprick in, in Muslim history. There was, it, was, it was just not a big deal. And that sounds so inflammatory to say right now based on all the rhetoric from both sides, the Christians in the West and, uh, and, and the terrorists and the rhetoric. It's the Crusaders. We've got to get those Crusaders. You know. And it was, uh, it's now George Bush and those that follow him with the cross are the new Crusaders. That's our new enemy. Well, um, that, that's not so. It was not a big deal for them. In fact, there was no word in Arabic for crusade until the mid-1800s. There was no writing um, no, no scholarship, I should say. There was writings before, but there was no scholarship on the Crusades by any Muslim scholars until 1899. It just wasn't a big deal. But, I should say, the Middle East, also another myth, didn't decline after this. They were still going strong. The odd thing is, after 1291, actually, yeah, after 1291, there were still multiple desperate attempts to reestablish the crusade, and it was mainly in the homeland and some in Turkey. But somehow, even with all this cost and loss of leadership in Europe, Europe took off like a rocket ship for some reason, economically, politically, militarily, with technology. Somehow, Europe just shot up like a, a skyrocket. And part of that, I think it's kind of cool. I, I, at lunch with Dave and we talked about this, is that you can really apply biblical principles to understanding what they were doing because that's what they were doing. They were looking at biblical principles. How, if we're fighting for Christ, if Christ is God, and we went to try to take back land that was, and protect Christians there, why would we lose? Why would we be suffered in defeat after that? And so they had to really wrestle with that. And so they started to introspect as a group and individually to say, well, if you look at the Bible, that happened to the, the, the people of God, the Jews all along the way, where they were blessed, but then they would suffer a huge defeat. And then they were blessed and they suffered suffer a huge defeat. When they suffered those defeats, God didn't leave it be a mystery. He said, that happened. I allowed that to happen because of your sin. And so they thought, well, why are we any different? Maybe, maybe we need to look at ourselves and maybe there's sin here that we're paying for. And so they really thought about that. They, um, it really, I think, changed people on an individual level, but there was also different values that the West had that the rest of the world didn't have, like business. It was actually not looked well upon to be a businessman in the rest of the world. Uh, and, and the church-state separation, that was unique to Christianity because Christians didn't have the state for hundreds of years. So if a society rises and falls, the church keeps going. Right? So you have this stable force in society that can't be shaken because they're not the ones, if you beat the emperor, if you beat the king, the church just keeps going. Because it's not all one. Islam, if you crush Islam, or if you crush the society, you also crush Islam. It's all woven together. It's all one. Most societies throughout history were all like that. Uh, the, the theology and the, even Greece, I mean, the theology and the state were all one. So this is a unique concept. Um, there's a few other things. So being a businessman, Became successful, became an issue in, in Europe because the printing press, for example, uh, they, I guess they had it in part of something a weird, fun fact I learned in studying the Crusades is that the printing press was invented centuries before in China and used for mainly government documents, and any sort of private use for profit was was not an option. It was just used by the um, bureaucrats and government officials. But something happened in Europe when the printing press was printed, right? It became big business, and that was something that really helped uh, the economy there. Um, the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar was uh, a group to protect pilgrims on their voyage, and they were crusaders. But they also got a secondary duty, and that was a financial responsibility to move payment back and forth to different powerful groups and governments. And they had this huge banking system, became very, very wealthy, and they were, um, they were pioneers in the financial business to be able to leverage loans, and uh, they'd have to get real creative because usury laws were, were very strict back then. 
Um, and this is just my depiction of kings and popes to uh, show the separation of church and state that uh, had an impact. So how do we now get this all garbled up based on the information that I conveyed to you? If that's true, why do we get attacked as Christians to say that we are the attackers and all these myths that come at us that Christianity is bad because of the crusaders and all the evils that they did? Well, part of it went off the tracks in the Enlightenment when there was a real anti-clerical movement and, uh, and reason ruled the day in the church. Authority was really looked at as being, uh, there, was a, there was a skepticism. Voltaire and Edward Gibbon were contemporaries, one from England and one from Voltaire from France, and they wrote condemning the Crusades and the whole Dark Ages in general, and it became a real propaganda tool to condemn the old days, and now we're enlightened, those are old days past, and now we're moving on. That's um, Thomas Madden, uh, Madden's and maybe others' hypothesis for why things started going down the wrong road. But then people in the West kept making it go down the wrong road and perpetuated that initial thought from the Enlightenment, Napoleon being one calling himself a new crusader, and then the real colonial imperial mentality of Europe going into the Middle East, those people also, the leaders in that movement also in the late 1800s were calling themselves the new crusaders. So now the West is really taking, taking this and going with it, okay? So the Middle East is dealing with occupation from all these Western nations and they're now thinking, yeah, this is, this is what the crusades was about. After World War I in 1920, the League of Nations then made it official for those nations to be occupied by France, England, and other European states. And it became so far to where the, the Sultan Saladin, who reconquered Jerusalem for the Muslims, was long since forgotten, as nobody remembered the Crusades in the Muslim world, was resurrected as this hero because he was able to beat off those evil Europeans who were coming down to try to steal his land. So Saladin, who's long since lost, was now revered. And this is a, a, a picture of Saladin here with the Crusaders now saying, yes, you know, we're surrendering to you. And it was now looked at as an honor. Now he, in all fairness, Saladin was, um, for uh, some purposes, a respectful leader. And he had mutual respect for Richard the Lionheart of England and, and uh, Richard also of Saladin. So there was some respect there. But he was never revered as this hero in the Muslim world until the Westerners made him such. There is a picture of him. And his tomb in Damascus was all overgrown and forgotten. And uh, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany in 1898, I think it was, wanted to go down and pay respect and give him a big bronze wreath and make a big deal of it. And the Syrians are, well, let's go look for this place because we don't know where that is. So, but it was all in the West. You know, the, people, the Westerners really thought this was a big deal. So they went and did it. And they found the little cave there after they got all the overgrowth out. And so this just keeps going, right? So you have this perpetuate, and the West is driving the show. It's not the Muslims really pushing this. They're just riding the rhetoric, and <laughs> they can recruit now real easily for their cause. The nationalists, the Islamists, those pushing for the West to get out of the Middle East can really use the, the, the Crusades well in their, in their push for that. And then you have Hollywood just doing it you know, more to our pop culture, where you have the Kingdom of Heaven a few years, maybe 10, 15 years ago, Orlando Bloom, uh, we'll start in the Kingdom of Heaven. So you'll see any sort of depiction in Hollywood is a off-the-rails remembrance of a reconstructed history of the Crusades. Now, Thomas Madden is on the bonus material, I guess, on this. I didn't see it, but he said it in one of the lectures I heard him speak on, speaking on all the things about how the movie was wrong. Um, and asked by Dennis Prager on a radio show in L.A., a nationally syndicated radio show, he says, he was asked, what do you think of the Kingdom of Heaven? He said, it was a great... Uh, depiction of what Hollywood producers think the Crusades were. <laughs> so I thought that was, a, that was a great explanation. So just, I'm going to rattle these off. Mel and others may have questions, and I hope we can have a little conversation. We've got plenty of time, about 30 minutes almost. But I'm going to try to rehash some of these objections and see how you can see it in a, somewhat of a new light, perhaps. So the Crusades are the main reason for tensions between the Middle East and the West. Perhaps. But a lot is to blame on the reconstructed history, right? What we think we know. Christianity condones violence because the church commanded the Crusades. Well, the church commanded to safeguard the pilgrims 
and retake what was captured. And they knew full well the just war theory that Augustine, back in the fourth century, had, had produced, and it was well accepted by the church. And so they knew that war was bad, but it was justified in this case because they were not the aggressors. Christians are hypocrites when pointing to Muslim acts of aggression. Um, and that's just, again, a misunderstanding that it wasn't aggression. It was a defensive war. Religion in general causes most of the world's war. That is something that is very easily debunked, and it's not covered in the talk I just gave. It's just one of the objections I couldn't leave off the list. Um, but if you look, there's something that was circulating recently. Some, some scholar just did a study on all of the world's wars like throughout history, like 10,000 years or something. I don't know how he had to go this far back, but it was, if you take out Islam, it's about 2% of the wars were ideologically driven by religious uh, denominations um, of some kind. The rest were all either secular or had nothing to do with, with religion at all. If you include Islam, it's still only like 4 or 5%. It's still very, very small. Interesting statistic. The Crusades are the main example of European colonialism that tramples on enlightened, yes, yet less militarized cultures. Well, is the Muslim world was very, very powerful. They had inherited all of the, uh, the, the, the uh, Greek and uh, Roman influence of that region prior to that. A lot of the philosophy, the schools, the technology, they, just, they were able to capture on all of that. They didn't have to create it themselves. And Europe was in shambles after the fall of Rome. There was, there was, it, it was nothing in comparison to what the Muslim Empire had going for it. And sure, it wasn't all unified because you had the Turks, uh, you had the Arab Muslims, and different groups within that. But still, it was not this innocent, enlightened group that that we trampled on. It was quite the reverse. The true approach to Christian evangelism is merciless conversion by the sword, as the Crusades revealed. Well, clearly that's not the case. The leadership launching the Crusades said expressly, do not do that. We are not converting um, anybody. That's not the purpose of it. It's all defensive to free our people. There's no difference between the assurance of heaven by taking part in a crusade than the, what the Muslim terrorists believe. Now, we, we know that the 72 virgins that you get after a jihad and you sacrifice yourself and call yourself a martyr, that they get paradise. Um, so that must be the same as the, the, the penance you get from your sins for when you go on a crusade. Well, we know that they, that was bad theology, so it's a bad assumption to think we even believe that. Um, so that, yes, people are mistaken, and there's people that were mistaken that went on the crusades. In fact, most of them weren't theologians. They're knights that were, in many cases, slaughtering each other, and now had some noble cause to fight for. So it's, it's, a, it's a bad comparison. And you might not have heard of all these, but these are everything I could think of. The Crusades caused the decline of the Middle East. That is, that is not true at all. The Middle East was fine. It, it, in fact, they expanded. Uh, it was Europe that somehow, out of the dustbin, was able to rise up and, uh, like nobody else has ever before. And I think that's it. So, Mally, it seems like you're real anxious for a question. I'm anxious to hear it. Do you have a question? No? Oh, sorry. I, anybody else? Uh, what do you think of the Crusades? I mean. Were there objections you heard that you haven't, uh, that, that weren't answered through, through the talk or information you found interesting? This part is interactive and it only works if there's <laughs> questions or comments <laughs> or it gets awkward. Jim. So I'll start it off. Um, so when you run into um, any of those objections, What I'm looking for is a place to start mm -hmm. that is a logical and organized approach. Mm -hmm. One that strikes me is if you look at the big picture and you had some data that said, let's talk about the Crusades and put it in perspective. And what I really liked was the map that you showed all of the uh, conflicts mm -hmm. and how small a, a territory the Crusades actually place in. Mm -hmm. And then if you use that as a starting point and say, mm -hmm. do you really understand what was happening mm -hmm. at the time and where this fits in history? Mm -hmm. And then you, you can transition into who wrote the history of this, mm -hmm. who modified the history, mm -hmm. and who are the, the people that I am yes. referencing yes. that really went back and looked you know, through technology and, and, and yes. getting the data where it is. Because I think 
what you pointed out from the, the various questions is there are many points of entry that people can pick up on and then they go right down that path and if you don't pull them back um, you can get bogged down trying to, to pick one of those yes. things. And I'm just wondering if the data that you had would, was real enlightening from the number of battles versus yes. the number of crusades were involved, the period of time and the territory. Yeah, this, it's a tough one. Good point, Jim. It's a tough one because it's so easy to knee-jerk get mad when you have the facts and you see the map, you see the objective data like that, and you see the rhetoric come at you, which is flat out demonstrably false. The knee-jerk is to get mad and say, how could you be so ignorant? But we have to have a little sympathy because they might have just gotten out of the, the Kingdom of Heaven movie, you know, or seen the Discovery Channel or the, you know. So it's, it's widespread. And this topic is, is one of those things where um, it's, um, it's so politically charged and emotional just like same-sex marriage, abortion, some of the hot topics, social issues, because there's this built-in political agenda on, on both sides of the West versus the Muslims debate that, well, where do you stand? Well, it's going to color your history, as it did throughout history on this topic. Um, and then once leaders and people of influence take that same information, it just spreads. So I think you're right. If you stick with the objective Let's, let's just start at the battles itself. I mean, the, the Muslims don't shy away from that. In fact, Muslims don't shy away from a lot of what Muhammad did, which we would find repulsive. They just don't find it repulsive. Uh, marrying a nine-year-old, you know, sl slaughtering relatives in his, uh, in his military campaign and um, things that he did and wrote. But um, that's not a place to start either. So if you start at the objective stuff, like the battles, where were things? What led up to before? You're not going to have time to go over a lot of this, but when people lob that accusation to you, it's all in the tactics. Those of you who, who went through the tactics class or have heard of uh, Greg Kokel, it's good to bounce it back off them and say, where's that coming from? Where have you heard it? Most people just, eh, that's just what I remember. And unfortunately, what I remember from high school textbooks or college classes, because I didn't get my hands on it, but so badly wanted to get my hands on the textbooks from Kelly and Foothills High School because the latest edition of the World History textbook talks about it expands the cultural impacts of the Crusades. And I so badly want to find out <laughs> what at, impact. At, at the end of the day, what you really want to do is challenge what the worldview actually is and get them to actually see, okay, what is the lens and the filter that I've received this information from? Mm -hmm. You know, because if they're just saying, well, this is what I heard, that's not really a worldview, that's just regurgitation. Right. So when you take it back to objective historical facts, you can say, well, let's let's look at this together. Yes. Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about this. Because, you know, like you said, I mean, they're just getting something that was, you know, spoon-fed to them by yeah. somebody with an agenda. Yeah, and a lot of times, yeah, it'll be just used as a smokescreen where it's not, if if the Crusades were justified somehow, oh, okay, now I'll, I'll pray the, you know, the sinner's prayer and I'll become a Christian. Well, that's very rarely the hang-up. So it gets down to that worldview issue. Where's the person coming from? And that's why you should well, the, the, other, the other problem that we have in today's society now is people get their information in sound bites mm -hmm, sure. from people who have influence and who may agree with parts of the world. You know, when Barack mm -hmm. Obama comes out and says, well, you know, I mean, Muslims aren't that bad. Look what you guys did with the Crusades. It's like, mm -hmm. so now you got people who ascribe to mm -hmm. a certain uh, liberal worldview that Barack Obama has, and they share similar values like that. And they're like, well, if he is, uh, basically he's establishing himself and giving himself almost like a moral mm -hmm. authority mm -hmm. to those other people that he's influencing. Yeah. So he, people like that can go carte blanche and spout yeah. off on something like that, gaining the backing of other people who are following him, yet they have no idea what mm -hmm. they're talking about. Yeah, and that's a good example. Information is being misinformed is more dangerous than being uninformed. That's right, that's right. Because then you're convinced of a lie, and that's not right. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, shifting a little bit, when the Europeans rose and became really a you know a mm -hmm. higher level society, were all of the Muslim dots that we saw were they suppressed because of that, or what happened to all those Muslim locations? I think till today you still have a Moorish influence in Spain, but it was pushed back a lot because that that increase where you had a lot of the Peruvian silver and and gold from the New World coming in. It, it was it was such a boom that they had, and the 
technology and the military weapons, they're able to push back and defend their homeland. Um, but it never went back into the old Christian world. That was lost for good. And was it, was it a, a bloody suppression, or was it just a sort of natural economic? I can't, I can't fully answer that. If anybody else here knows, um, <coughs> I ended at 1291. I couldn't go past that. Well, I'm wondering if people think that the Middle East was, uh, it was a bloody you know, suppression that it was because of all those European locations and what happened in Europe more than what happened at the Crusades. And mm. so just, colonialism. Mm -hmm. Right. Colonialism came in. Yeah. How did colonialism get established in, in India? Africa and mm. some of those other places when England became, was it, was it kind of osmosis through bringing in business or was there actually? My understanding, a lot of that was made official after World War I, I but maybe Dave, you have some. Might, if we're talking about crusades, we're talking about 1800s. So yeah, when you said they rose, so, so, so out. Mm -hmm. the, the rising happened because when the Christian West went into Jerusalem and Antioch, especially, there's a, there's a, 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 there was a, a library there that's full of Euclid and Ptolemy and Aristotle and all the Western writings that have been lost to the West. Um, and it, cr it created the, the foundation for scholarship in the West that wasn't there prior to that. And it, and it created a new thirst and a hunger for figuring out how God's world worked in the scientific explosion. And an interesting other fact is 1492 um, is known to us as what's what's the significant thing of 1492? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Do you know what happened earlier that year? <coughs> who, who gave him the charter to go sail the ocean blue? Was it his native Spain. Italy? Spain. It was Ferdinand and Isabella of, of Spain, who had just six months prior finally consolidated with Christian control of Spain for the first time since the first Moorish invasion. Mm. So <clears throat> they kicked the final Moors out of Spain, established solid Christian control of all of Spain, <coughs> and that same year they give the charter to Columbus to the ocean blue, and that's when the money, the, ex the expansion of the West really happened, because you've had 150 years or so of, of scientific endeavor and realizing that it's a heliocentric world and all that stuff happened. Christopher Columbus, there's a rumors they came across some old charters of naval circumnavigation from Chinese stuff that was found in the Middle East. And so they opened up trade routes, they opened up science, and all of a sudden the West took all that. And because of the foundation of Christian thought and, and, and some of the stuff Dan talked about, Christians took that and used wonder and the love of God to pursue the natural world. Muslims today are pretty much the same as they were in the First Crusade culturally. Their cultural driving force and the, the mentality and what they do is no different. In 1095, that's far superior to, to, to the West. By the time the Enlightenment happened, you get a couple hundred years in gunpowder and sailing ships, and suddenly we're vast, vastly superior to them mm -hmm. technologically, and that's mm -hmm. the table's turn. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> and if Dave wasn't... Uh, wasn't being an usher today. He would have been up here with me doing this. So I know he's got a background in this, and we read some of the same books leading up to it. So thanks, Dave. Jen? I think the best place to start in terms of an apologetic conversation with someone who is, um, you know, denouncing Christianity for the Crusades is, you know, the, the map and all that was interesting, and I, and I like that part. But then I thought, okay, if you're taking this to a, um, a debate, you know, well, they did worse than we did is not really a, a good place to stand, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and, I mean, it's true, but still, that being our argument mm -hmm. of, like, well, but they were way worse than us right. isn't a really good place to stand. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked what you were saying, that there is, there is evidence that here is what the Crusades were to be. And, you know, they were to mm -hmm. be defensive, mm -hmm. they were to be, um, you know, protective of the Byzantine Empire, and in their thought, to regain something that someone took from them. Mm -hmm. So the intention behind the Crusades was never to be an aggressive force. And I think that's where you start, because people see, and I think you hit it right on the head, people see the expansion of the Western world through the British Empire, as the Crusades, and that what, like you said, they just kind of grabbed the name and ran with it. That mm -hmm. wasn't the Crusades. The Crusades were something that happened 800 years before that, and the intention was never to be 
brutal, murderous, all mm -hmm. the things that people want to paint the Crusades and say, well, right. Christians are these horrible, murderous people. Well, no, we actually, we actually never did that. Yeah. The intention of the original Crusade was this, was, was protection and um, an effort to regain something that had been stolen. Mm -hmm. um, and then the advancement of the Western world had nothing to, they, they were Christian nations um, to an extent, you know, if you want to say that about Britain, but, but their, the impetus of that expansion was not to promote Christianity. It was, a, it was an economic thing. Yeah. They wanted more territory. They were, mm -hmm. they were expanding because of economics, right. not because of religion. Mm -hmm. And so then it takes the whole bite out of the crusade argument at all. Yeah. And it, it keeps you away from who's worse. Yeah. I think, I think even talking about the Muslims at all should, you should just leave that out of your argument. Yeah. I think the, the takeaway today, if you want to find out how to, to, discuss this with friends or people bring it up is, is the two-prong approach. The first thing I mentioned before the class and what you touched on too is that number one, if bad, Christians did bad things, well, so what? They, they do that and there's people that can call themselves Christians all they want and go rape, pillage, and torture, but what does that have to do with Jesus? So you look at what they were fighting for, they were either right or wrong, but that's a red herring. That's, that's something that has nothing to do with, with Jesus and what I'm trying to tell you about him. So there's a disconnect there and that's a fallacy that, that, that goes off the logic tracks, right? So that's number one. But number two is even if you say that that has some logical connection, which it doesn't, you may be dealing with some misinformation, let me crack the record. And often we don't have time to go into that or the knowledge to do that. But the first one should be, so what? Yeah, Christians did lots of bad things. I think a good context to think about is not necessarily the. Uh, I, I think you might have gone too far. The, the Crusaders did go in and they killed people, and that was the nature of war. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to realize that from 632 to 1096, it was unabated Muslim conquering of Christian lands, and they would just go in and take stuff. And do you guys know where Tours, France is? It's about 45 minutes south of Paris. That's how far they got. They were conquered all the way into France. And it wasn't until Charles Martel in the 700s beat him back at that point that, that that stopped the march into France. And it took another 100 years to kick him out of France across the Pyrenees <laughs> back into Spain. And mm -hmm. Europe was about to become a Muslim country, a Muslim land. And so you have almost 500 years of unabated conquering of <laughs> Muslims, and we have a very <coughs> small incursion into Muslim lands. And the, the oaths that the pilgrims took for their indulgences was that they, they, they swore a vow to visit the holy sepulcher of Jesus Christ. That was their vow. Their vow wasn't to go conquer Jerusalem and hold it and kill a bunch of Muslims. It was to go visit the holy sepulcher and claim the soul of the sin. That was the vow they took. And so on that vow, they marched to Jerusalem. It wasn't, a, you know, and that's a very different mentality than the Muslim aggression towards the Christian world. Now, you know, you, there's all kinds of philosophical questions you can dive into, but I think, yeah, you know, I think Dan's right. I mean, you just, it has nothing yeah. to do with Jesus, yeah. but the people that went did believe in Jesus, and they were, that they were not these greedy, powerful, yeah. And it is important to understand <laughs> Islam and what consequence it would have had had there not been a rainstorm in Vienna that day that they were going to storm and take Vienna because that could have been the last hope and now we all speak Arabic. Mm. Because if the West was taken and the New World was already you know, bringing in the gold and silver, it was on path for them to go to America and be the patriots, <laughs> you know, speak in Arabic. So what would have happened had they taken over? Um, today you see the sword in the Middle East. Here you see the birth rate. In the West, the birth rate is below two. So that means we're not making people uh, in proportion for our population. So we're shrinking. In Europe, it's far worse. In, we're, in Europe, it's also far worse, the Muslim immigration. So if you see the expanse of Muslim, Islam, you could almost see a map today, but not battles as much. Sometimes you'll see you know, attacks, but you'll see a growth of population. 
And it's really important to understand the impact that each of these ideologies, Christianity, these worldviews, Christianity and Islam have on government and the public sphere. Because in Islam, there is no separation. In fact, you can't even have a government. It is all Islam. It is all the caliphate. It is all theology. Those in the Middle East that are serious about Islam, it's maybe 10% are super serious about it. The rest are secular like we are. But those that are serious don't talk about football or uh, their, their kids. They talk about Muhammad. They talk about Umar. They talk about the battles that happen. That they get around. That's all they talk about. That's the world. That's Islam. And the West is very different. Like I said, the separation of church and state. We can have tolerance for others. In Islam, not so much. So just the consequence of having that war of ideas. It's not just one religious group against another religious group. There are differences. But that's a whole other discussion. That's where we need to know and understand and appreciate what Islam is really all about. Dan? Yeah. So I've heard the argument that what took place prior to 1096 <coughs> with the, the Moorish invasions, etc., that was taking place with armaments is actually taking place today now with feet and dollar signs and mm. labor, labor, labor. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and that the exact same thing is taking place. It's just happening in a non-violent manner, mm -hmm. and the incursion that's taking place is, is in some ways a stealth one, and mm -hmm. at some point we're going to be right back to that situation. Yeah, and I don't know how much it is a concerted, coordinated effort, but it is happening. I mean, you just see the numbers. And it may be intentional, but it's also just kind of naturally on that path. That's just how it's going because of, I mean, the, the culture in Islam, there's more babies born. And so that's a real simple one. That part I don't think is intentional to take over. I think that's just the migration and the move maybe is. And the chaos in the Middle East, you know, I mean, wouldn't you rather be in Paris? It's just like um, back in the day when the Catholic Church encouraged people to have more children so that they could populate the world of Christians. I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah, it could be part of it. I just saw a video of uh, Muslims from Brussels. Did, did mm. it to you? And he talks about Belgistan. that exact... Pardon? Belgistan. Yeah. That's what, that's what he said. It's very intentional. Yeah. And he says, we have this many people, and soon this city will be ours because of the political the difference, the religion mm. is the politics. Mm -hmm. And everyone will be, women will be wearing burqas, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And it's, they are very intentional. Yeah. Well, the Daily Caller had an article, I think, this week saying that by 2040, you, in the U.S., Muslim will be, or Islam will be the second largest religion here, and that the path is going. Ten years ago, Mark Stein wrote a book called America Alone, and at that time of the writing, um, over 50% of all people living in France under the age of 25 were Muslim. Hmm. It's ten years later now. And going back to this topic, you have the madrasas, you have the Muslim kids in the West all being raised that the West are crusaders who just want to spread by the sword. And then you have people in the West in Kathleen Foothills High School, presumably. I haven't seen the textbook, but throughout the nation uh, teaching and, and hearing the same thing, that the crusaders are out to get the Muslims. Attila? Yeah, when did the word crusade in the West become negative? Because, um, I mean, as late as World War II, Roosevelt called the liberation of Europe a crusade. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, he said that that's a positive thing. And mm -hmm. I think, Jenna, that was the great takeaway for me today, too, is that um, crusade is to reclaim what was taken. It's not an mm -hmm. ex exploration into uh, foreign lands right. to take something else. Same way, liberation of uh, Europe um, by the Allied forces wasn't a conquest. It was Mm -hmm. um, from the Nazis. So, and now today we see Campus Crusade for Christ changing its name. Good point. Crusade has a negative connotation, not just in the Middle East, but here in the West. So when did the phrase Crusade take that turn? Yeah, that's a really great point. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I have a precise, again, not being the scholar, not being the scholar that you are either, <laughs> another expert among us, um, I, I think it would have been in the 20th century because you have in the early part of the 20th century those European colonialists using it in a positive term of themselves they're saying we're the new crusaders so even into the 20th century you have that in a positive light self-described perpetuating that misconstructed view of the crusades and then let me think the um, the it, it, it could be. You had the State of Israel in 1948 add some more fire, but that's, that's a Jewish state. Um, 
Yeah, it might be within the last half century or less where that's being used because the you, you don't see, I think, even in the... I think it's a really f a recent phenomenon for the rhetoric in the Muslim uh, extremists that are the terrorists like al-Zahiri and, and bin Laden. That was in the 90s. So as far as it being used as rhetoric like that, and then the 90s was also when Bill Clinton uh, made a famous speech at Georgetown where he's condemning uh, crusader, specific crusader acts in Jerusalem that historians say did not happen. Um, so you have the 90s really in both the West saying, I'm sorry, <laughs> and the Islamic world saying, you're right, you're sorry, you're going to be sorry. So you have the 90s was really kind of the first notable influx of that. Would you disagree or you, is that what you think? Yeah, so it's pretty recent. So that's probably why a lot of the textbooks are lagging behind. Hopefully with the new studies by these widely respected scholars that eventually starts trickling into textbooks and people start, yeah, well, come on, it's the public schools. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We're getting up to a quarter after, so I had planned for, and I don't want to make the mistake of saying what we're doing next month because it's a fluid class and we want to hit what is relevant so that we're prepared as Christians to be able to go out to the world, but um, I may take on the Inquisition next because it's a, it was a research project I did in grad school and so I'm kind of ready for it. And it's also right in the dovetails of this. So that person who's throwing it out as a smoke screen now is educated because you told them all the truth of the Crusades. Well, says, well now, what about the Inquisition? So there's a lot of myths about the Inquisition as well that we can hopefully correct From next month. Right, thank you.